All right, welcome class. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, parallel forces. And so what I'm going to be doing is going over some of the notes and then there are going to be some questions also embedded into this video here. So make sure that you uh, watch the video, answer the questions, and submit it. And this way you'll be counted as being present and also you'll get credit uh, for the assignment as well. So. If you don't, then you will, will be marked as being absent and also will not get credit for this assignment here. So please make sure that you watch the video, answer the questions, and you submit the work. All right, so let's get started. Uh, it would be helpful if you have your notes out and you can um, follow along as we go through this. And there's a lot of information here, so I'm just kind of going over some of the basic information here for starters. So we're getting into parallel forces. Uh, so the first thing we're going to be getting into here is the center of gravity. And this is something that I've talked about here before. So parallel forces, um, they act in the same or in opposite direction at different points on an object. Uh, the center of gravity, sometimes it's labeled C or CG, is a point at which all of its weight can be considered to be concentrated. Now, I kind of showed this in another format. Let's say you have something like a rock, something that's not of a uniform shape to it. And if you look at every single particle going through here, you have these parallel forces. In other words, due to every particle of this object, gravity is pulling down on it and it's pulling down um, all the way through it and pulling straight down on this. So all these forces are acting parallel to each other. Now, because there's less mass over here, you're not going to have nearly as much force taking place over here. This area is a little bit thicker. You're going to have a little bit more force pulling down on this side. So you're going to have an uneven distribution of forces over the entire underside of this object. And when you take all those things into account, the what they refer to as the center of gravity, this is a, the one central point that is um, where you assume all the weight to be located. So in other words, if you take all these downward parallel forces and basically kind of average them out, what you would find here is that they'll appear to be coming from this one central location acting straight down. So in other words, all these forces added together will be creating this downward force, what we refer to as the force of weight. The center of gravity is you will also have what's called an equilibrium force. So F sub E here is a force that's equal to the, um, in this case, is equal to the force of weight, but in the opposite direction. So the weight of the object is pulling down. The equilibrium force is the force that will bring equilibrium to the system by exerting a force equal but opposite to that. So in other words, if you were to balance this rock on your finger, the weight of the rock is, is trying to pull it down. Your finger is pushing this in the upward direction, equal but opposite to what's happening over here. Now, if you have something that's more of a uniform, um, more of a uniform object, for example, if you were to have a meter stick, that's a little bit more of a uniform object here, but technically, if you have like a wooden meter stick, technically that's not really a uniform object here. Something like a steel uh, one here would be a little bit more uniform. And because you have and basically an even distribution of matter all the way through here, all these parallel forces still will be, able to be parallel, but also they will be of the same value all the way for every unit of length that you go down through here. So you'll have this force will be the same as this force, which would be the same as this force. And so if you add up all these forces together, they, they would result in the force of weight of the object. And if you take the average of all of these, you would end up having where all these forces on average will be occurring, will, will appear to be taking place at this point right here, what they refer to as the center of gravity. And so if I were to take this meter stick, the equilibrium force would be the point where I would place my finger right underneath here, exerting force upward. So my one equilibrium force, but basically like bouncing on my fingertip at the 50, 50 centimeter mark on a meter stick, will cancel out all these other forces acting down on it. So it's the one force that will bring equilibrium to all these other forces. Now, if you look at this image here, you have this, uh, you have this child here who is riding on a bicycle across a tightrope. Obviously, he is not a trained professional. 
and some of the science museums, they have these type of rides here where you can get onto something like this and ride across a uh, tightrope. And anyone and everyone is capable of doing this. And the reason why this is, is possible here is if you look down here, there's this massive weight down here. And it's also quite some distance away from the underside of this bicyclist. And so what ends up happening here is that the center of gravity is actually probably more of somewhere down here. In other words, the child and the bicycle here, they're exerting a, a force down. But the center of gravity of this whole system of the child and the weight is somewhere underneath this wire. And as long as it remains underneath this wire, this boy is going to remain upright. Now, if you were to put someone who is larger on there, then what's going to happen is the center of gravity will begin to get shifted further and further up here. And if you get it to the point where the center of gravity is on the line, what would happen then when a person gets onto this, this thing will reach a new equilibrium where it will not be upright like this, it will be horizontal, which would not make it for a very good day. So um, you have to, for these type of rides, you have to maintain the center of gravity below the area of support. If it's at, it, at this, this thing would be trying to go horizontal, or worse yet, if you put the center of gravity above this, the whole thing would flip upside down, and the child here will be hanging upside down off this bicycle, which would not make the parents very happy. And again, here's another uh, view of the same thing. Um, you have someone who is riding on this um, bicycle here. And again, if you notice, you have a weight underneath here. And the purpose of this is to bring the center of gravity below the area of support. And also, too, if you look at this, um, now, it does take a, a lot of skill in order to walk across the tightrope. But this scene right here is actually not that difficult to do. Um, it's now really not much different than what's happening with this. The only thing is, what they've done here is they've replaced this with a person. So this lady underneath here is actually acting as a counterweight to bring the center of gravity down below this. What would be even more impressive is if they were able to do this without having someone hanging underneath here. But this looks kind of a little bit more spectacular here, but she's actually serving a very important purpose of basically being like this weight underneath here. So to have this child go, go across here without this weight, that would be a very, very difficult feat to do. But having that weight underneath here makes this very possible. Not discounting that there's a lot of skill in this, but this is actually a little bit safer than what it um, appears to be. But then again, just remember you signed a form here that I and the school will not be held responsible for any type of um, accidents or anything like that. So please do not do this at home or at a friend's house. A little bit later on, I'll show you uh, these videos here, but not for today. Now, translational and rotational equilibrium, uh, the bar is not accelerating, and rotation, if any, is going to be constant, and occurs when a force is, is exerted on the, on the center of gravity. Okay, on the center of gravity. Uh, so, for example, translational uh, equilibrium basically means that if I apply a force, the whole object will be moving. So, in other words, if I were to have something like a meter stick, translational equilibrium were, would be if the whole meter stick would move. Rotational equilibrium will, is a little bit different. This has to do with the rotation, in other words, if the object is spinning. And so rotational equilibrium is basically where you would have, uh, where the object is able to rotate or, or the other one here. So to have something that is translational and rotational equilibrium, kind of envision if you were to take a meter stick and toss it in the air and give it a, a spin to it. You would have both translational uh, motion and also rotational motion, which is taking place. Now, in this case here, we're talking about bringing it into equilibrium where everything is being bounced out. So, we're getting into something which is called torque, and a lot of times this symbolizes a capital T. 
Now, sometimes you'll actually not see it as a normal T here, but kind of a little bit more of a script type of T here, where does they have like a little bit of a wavy line up here on the top. Um, so either way, sometimes just know that sometimes the script for the capital T will look a little bit more of a of a wavy line on the uh, for the top bar of it. But torque is the product of the force and the length of its torque arm, and it. The unit it's measured in is a unit called a newton meter. Now, a couple of terms here. The torque arm is the bar in which the forces are acting perpendicular to it. So, in other words, the torque arm is the typically the object that you're pushing against. The pivot point, sometimes called the fulcrum, this is a stationary point that the torque arm is rotating around. So, for example, if you're dealing with a wrench, the the pivot point is wherever um, would be like the bolt that you're exerting a force against. The torque arm would be the wrench itself, the handle of the um, of the torque arm, or, or the handle of the wrench is the torque arm. So, kind of a simplified image of this here is like if you have a, a bar here, and the bar would be the torque arm, and the pivot point is where this thing is rotating around it. So the torque is you know, if you're applying the force over this point right here, then the torque is around this pivot point right here. So the way that torque is calculated is is the product of the force times the distance. So you're taking this force, and the key thing is that the force is perpendicular to the torque arm itself. And sometimes you'll see what looks like an, like an upside down capital T on here, which stands for perpendicular. So the force has to be perpendicular to the torque arm, and you take this force times the distance away from the pivot point. And it's always to the pivot point, not to the like the, the edge of the object. How far out any of this material over here doesn't matter. It's this force versus this distance right here. And again, the units for this is um, units of newton meters, or sometimes you might see these two flipped around where it's meter newtons. It's the same thing here because force is measured in newtons, distance is going to be measured in meters. In the imperial units, sometimes you'll see um, pounds foot or foot pounds or pounds inch or inch pounds. Uh, but again, it's a unit of force and a unit of distance. They're being multiplied to each other here. Nothing cancels out. It's just like a newton meter, not a newton per meter, newton meter. So in rotational equilibrium, the sum of the clockwise torques equals the sum of the counterclockwise torques about any pivot point. Now you're going to see this symbol here, and this is a Greek letter sigma. In mathematical terms, this basically means sum, S-U-M. So in other words, you're adding. So if you add up all the to uh, clockwise torques and you add up all the counterclockwise torques, if it's in rotational equilibrium, all the clockwise and all the counterclockwise will be equal to each other. So let me give, show it to you this way here. We have an object here, and so it's pivoting around this point right here. So this is the pivot point or the fulcrum of the object. There are two forces. I'm sorry, there's three forces here. You have this 300, I'm sorry, 30 newtons. I can, yes, I can read here. You have this 30 newtons. You have this 20 newton, and you have the 10 newton. Now, what you have to decide here is which one's clockwise and which one is counterclockwise. Well, this is a pivot point. Clockwise will be rotating around in this direction here. Okay, this will be a clockwise rotation. Now, in this situation, there are two of them. You have this 20 newtons is trying to rotate this clockwise, and oops, and also you have this 10 newtons, which is also trying to act clockwise. And so for the clockwise torques, you're going to be taking the, the torque here is force times distance. So we have 20 newtons and it's 3 meters away from the pivot point. So 20 times 3 is 60 newton meters. So 20 times 3 here is 60 newton meters. This 10 newton, yes, it's 3 meters from the next one here, but you always take it from the force to the pivot point. So this 10 newtons is actually 6 meters away from the pivot point. So 10 times 6 
is 60 newton meters. So 10 times 6 meters here. Again, we have 60 newton meters. So there is a total of 120 newton meters of torque that are trying to act clockwise. In other words, this one plus the torque of this one right here are both trying to rotate these clockwise. So there's a total of 120 newton meters of torque. So it's kind of like if you have a bar and two people are trying to rotate this bar clockwise. At the same time, you also have another individual who is trying to push it counterclockwise. So this 30 newtons is trying to rotate it in this direction here, which is a counterclockwise direction. So if he's exerting 30 newtons and it's 4 meters away from the pivot point, 30 times 4 is 120 newton meters, which you see down here, which is acting counterclockwise. Now, if you look at the the clockwise torques versus the total counterclockwise torques, these two are in balance to each other. So if you were to have three people trying to rotate this, this beam around, and two of them are trying to push down in this direction, and one person is pushing around this direction here, nothing will happen because they're canceling each other out. So now this system is in a state of equilibrium. Or if it, they are rotating, then they will be rotating at a constant velocity. If there was an imbalance, then you would have an acceleration, which is taking place. But in this case here, the object is either stationary, or if it's moving, it's moving at a constant velocity. And then here's another example here. Here's your center of gravity. This is the center of rotation. And you're looking at clockwise and counterclockwise here. So you have this 10 newtons, and it's trying to rotate it. If this is a pivot point here, it's trying to rotate it in a clockwise direction. So you're going to have 10 newtons, and it's 3 meters away from the pivot point. So it's 2 meters from here, plus an additional 1 meter, so it's 3 meters away from it. So this is exerting, this force is exerting 30 newton meters of torque. Then also you have this 30 newtons, and it's 1 meter away from the pivot point. So 30 times 1, again, is 30 newton meters. But then there's also a third one over here as well. And this one here is acting on the pivot point. So it's exerting 20 newtons, but the distance is zero, so there's zero newton meters. One way to kind of think about this is like if you were to have a teeter-totter, and let me see if I can draw this out. Okay. Let's see how well I can draw on this here. This is not an easy thing to do here. So let's say here, this is my, my teeter-totter. And we put someone over here. We'll just put them, represent them as a box. And we put someone over here. And they're both equal distance. And this person is exerting a force downward. And this one is exerting a force downward. Okay. And let's say they're both the same distance here. And right now they're in equilibrium. So it's kind of like if you go on the playground and you have two individuals on either side and you know, you're able to go up and down equally here. If you both lift up your feet, you'll just kind of hang here in the middle. But let's say you have a third person, and they want to sit on this, but you want to maintain equilibrium. If you put them on this side, they're going to have too much torque on this side. It's going to rotate it in this direction. If you put them over here, it's going to cause it to rotate in this direction. There's only one physical place you could put a third person on here and still maintain equilibrium, and that would be right here in the middle because when they're sitting right here in the middle, they're exerting a force straight down through here, through the pivot point. So therefore, they exert zero torque. Any other location, slightly one way or the other way, would introduce where you have slightly more torque on one side than the other, and the whole system will now begin to rotate in that direction. So torque always causes, or is always trying to cause, a rotation to occur. So the torque arm must always be measured perpendicular to the direction of the forces. If a force is at an angle to the torque arm, what you need to do is you need to graphically draw the x and y force vectors in respect to the torque arm. Calculate the force vector perpendicular to the torque arm. So in other words, if you were looking at a, an aerial view of a door, so let's say this is the hinge of the door, this is a door, and someone's pushing on the door at this angle right here. Now, when you're figuring out torque, you don't use this force times this distance right here. Instead, 
the force is always going to be perpendicular to the torque arm. So what you have to do is you break this down into its x y components, and you only want to look at the force that's going to be acting perpendicular to that. So if you know the angle of it, this is the force that's actually causing the torque to take place here. So even though the person might be exerting this much force right here, the amount of torque is based upon the perpendicular force to it. Now, something similar to that, can I imagine if you were to go up to a door, so let's say this is the pivot point, and here's a door, okay? And someone came up to the edge of the door right here and push inward. Not too bad, almost straight here, okay? Pushed in this way here. Or we're getting onto a door and pull it outward. The door would do nothing because there is no perpendicular force acting on it here. So in order to cause this door to swing one way or the other way here would be you would have to have some force either pushing up this way or some force pushing this way. If you go up along the length of the board parallel to the door, nothing's going to happen because there is no torque. So you have to be exerting a force, something like this, that's going to be perpendicular to that in order to cause a rotation to occur in this situation um, downward here. So this is just like an a teeter-totter here. Again, this is your pivot point. And, you know, if you've ever been on a teeter-totter and someone is a little bit more massive than someone else here, typically the more the heavier person would have to scoot forward and the lighter person would have to scoot further back. Um, or, you know, sometimes you, you can actually take some of the teeter-totters, you can actually take them apart and move them away here. This is something that sometimes you see on some college campuses where... Um, they'll have like a teeter-totter-a-thon here where they'll be raising money and they'll be teeter-tottering for hours on end. So uh, this is what, perhaps what this is uh, taking place here. Okay, now I've shown this image before and I mentioned that um, you won't be seeing this again and this is that situation. You know, if you remember last time we were dealing with like the angles and how much force is acting along the arm and along the cable, the tension that's in the cable, but this is also a torque arm that we just take a place. So for example, if you look at this, this right here is a pivot point. And it's a pivot point you don't want to be rotating one way or the other because that means this thing is going to be crashing. This is going to be exerting a force down over here. So this, whatever they're lifting here, is going to be exerting a force down and it's acting perpendicular to the torque arm. And so what's going to happen here is that as this thing is moving out, there's a force acting at this distance, which means there is a torque that's acting on this side right here. Now, from this view, this one is going to try to rotate it in a counterclockwise direction. But you don't want it rotating clockwise because that can make for a very bad day for the person who's sitting right here operating the machine. But if you notice over here, there is a counterweight. And the purpose of this counterweight is to counterbalance the torque that's acting over here. So you want the, the torque, in this case here, torque clockwise to equal the torque counterclockwise. So this is exerting a, a very large amount of force on this side. And this thing also moves in and out in order to maintain balance of the system here. So if they are, say they're picking up something over here and they move it way out here, one thing you'll see here is on these machines is that this counterweight will also move outward in order to maintain balance between those two points. If they try to lift up something too heavy here, then they risk uh, damaging this and possibly you know, loss of life and injuries and everything else like that. So um, operating these things here, there's a bit of a hazard to those. And this is how you end up uh, parking your donkey here too. But uh, so you're going to the market and you want to make sure your donkey doesn't walk away. Apparently this is what you do here. But this right here, is your pivot point. And what's happening here is that you have a torque arm along this. 
But what's happened is they have too much weight acting over here. There's way too much weight on this side versus the amount of weight which is on this side right here. Now to prevent that from happening, one, a couple things can happen here. One is take some of the weight that's on here and move it a little bit more towards the front. And or another thing you can also do too is extend the arm of this. You don't have to get a heavier uh, mule here, but in order to increase the torque, you can also just make this longer. So there's two ways of increasing the torque here, is that you can either, if you look at the form for torque, torque is equal to force times distance. Okay, so two ways of increasing the torque. If I make the force bigger, I can increase the torque. Or another way is if I increase the distance, you can also increase the torque as well. And for those of you in the STEAM class here, uh, th this is something that we deal a lot of. And we'll get into that later when uh, we, we all get back together again. Okay, so this is all I have for today. Um, so make sure to answer the questions and submit them. And I hope you guys have a great weekend. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye.